Hi guys, uh, welcome back to another video. Uh, welcome back on this uh, Easter weekend. So my goal this week was to start and finish this book, Cicero, The Nature of the Gods. Um, I thought this was the first Cicero I read, but it's not. Um, I've read some of his other stuff, some of his speeches uh, and uh, the Yergothine War thing or whatever. Anyway, uh, but I've known about Cicero for a long time. I've read parts of him, stuff on him many times. Anthony, what's his name? His history, his biography of Cicero was really good. Um, and I, I had to study a lot about Cicero over the years because um, my graduate um, specialization was um, Augustine. And Augustine was very strongly influenced by Cicero um, in the special way that uh, uh, Augustine was a uh, rhetorician. He was a student of public speaking, and obviously Cicero was the, was the master of public speaking. Um, but also, um, and this is, ties into the reason I read the book that I'm reading today, or part of the reason, is that it was reading one of Cicero's works, which got Augustine into uh, philosophy. Um, that work is no longer, uh, no longer with us. It's been lost. And, but many of his other works um, remain, many of his other dialogues and so on. And when he was a young man, Augustine wrote uh, some of his first works in, in, in dialogical form as well being influenced by Cicero uh, specifically, as well as people like Plato or whatever. Um, this work on the nature of the gods or the nature of the gods, um, sort of, it was what I expected. I, I have been told that, that Cicero was less an original thinker than he was a uh, encyclopedist in a way, um, a textbook writer kind of. So Cicero's great importance was the way in which he acted as a bridge from Greek uh, philosophy to the Romans, okay? So he was one of the early and most uh, eager students of philosophy, and philosophy is a Greek phenomenon. It wasn't Latin, um, but by, by his time, around um, the end of the, I don't know, first millennium BC and uh, towards the era of, you know, of Christ, he, uh, the Roman people were, they didn't, well, they were kind of prejudiced against Greek things and Greek, the Greeks uh, sort of looked on, or the Romans looked on the Greeks kind of like the way uh, Everybody looked on the French in the previous century, I suppose. Um, France was a cult center of culture, but it was also a center of decadence and effeminacy and so on. Things that kind of rubbed the Romans the wrong way. So, and I mean, obviously Cicero was an intellectual rather than, rather than um, the uh, personification of Roman vigor. Um, like it's many heroes in the past, Scipio, Coriolanus, Caesar, um, Brutus, the king, Brutus, and uh, a million other figures. Most Roman heroes were, uh, were warriors. They weren't intellectuals. And so only in the later age would, would there be uh, much interest in people like Ovid or Virgil or Cicero or whomever. So, and, and Cicero's life is a great, to me, strikes me as a great embodiment of the collision of Roman and Greek values, and that in the end, the brutality of the Roman ways uh, triumphs. So Cicero, Cicero is very powerful in his day um, because of his intellect and his public speaking ability um, and yet he although he had a bit of dabbling as a consul he had a bit of dabbling 
in in war stuff that wasn't his forte and so he was a bit eventually uh, eaten up by the uh, move towards the away from the Republic which was a a place where a speaker was a very powerful and very influential figure uh, to the Empire where um, it didn't matter a whole lot and so if I remember correctly Cicero was killed under Caesar Augustus's order because I guess he wasn't Caesar Augustus at the time he was Octavius because Mark Anthony didn't like him I think if that I think that that's correct correct me if I'm wrong in the comments or whatever but that's what my memory is but anyway in the heyday of Cicero's life he he uh, wrote lots of um, well he was most known of course for his speech writing and it was speech giving and and he was a you know a real teacher to the Romans um, and he tried to introduce Rome uh, Greek philosophy to the Romans and it sort of took and sort of didn't take <clears throat> now ultimately uh, okay so let, let's talk about the the book a little bit it's it's a dialogue but it's not really a dialogue it's it's uh, it's not a dialogue according to the model of Plato um, nor according to the model of Augustine I suppose um, it's really a set of speeches so I mean, think maybe think maybe more along the lines of the book of Job, for instance, where speech after speech after speech is given. And the two there's two main disputants in this, and they represent generally the uh, Epicurean and the Stoic schools of thought. And so the two two representatives of those schools kind of hash it out. So in each of the three books or chapters, whatever you want to call them, there's a speech by this by the Epicurean, then a speech by the Stoic or whatever. Um, actually, reverse order: Stoic and then Epicurean, I believe. Um, and there's not a great deal of discovery in this book. Like, like you wouldn't look at it and say, "Oh, in this book, Cicero proves this, this, or that." Um, he doesn't. It's more of an exposition. Okay, so it's not a, di a philosophical dialogue. It's it's more of a philosophical exposition, and I'm not undermining it for that reason. It's an it's an, a very valuable work, and if you want sort of a crash course on, well, the views on God at in at around the turn of the sen turn of the millennium, then read this book. Um, it it made me think a lot of, about the first especially the first couple books of Augustine's City of God and further, I, I can't remember, I, I don't have memorized anymore the progression of the City of God, but um, the exposition of Roman views about the gods and Greek views about the gods and the philosophical views about the gods. I, I, I know that Cicero wasn't Augustine's only source and not even his primary source on Roman religion, but nevertheless, it's a really great epitome of it. Um, so I, I was looking for a shorter book this week that I could just start and finish in one week. And this book, uh, in this in this edition, it starts on page 69, giggity, and ends on page um, 235. So it's less than 200 pages. And most of those pages are pretty easy reading. And really interesting reading. There's a few points where um, it's boring because um, the argument becomes just like too many examples in the argument. Um, so, like, there's a few times of that where one, one, for instance, one of the uh, interlocutors is arguing for. Uh, basically the argument from design so it's talking about how beautiful the world is and that has to reveal the genius and the and the and the of the gods right and it's just so many example example after example after exa example and then later on uh, I believe it's the Epicurean who who is arguing for sorry out of focus there who is arguing for um, the absurdity of 
the traditional understanding of the gods, it just gives too many examples. Okay, it's just too many examples, and, and this will be familiar again. This is reminding me of City of God as well. Um, too many examples of the contradictions and the irrationality of the gods as traditionally understood, as understood in the mythology and so on. So there were those two moments where, which were a bit, you know, could have been a page or two shorter, uh, those sections. Interestingly, there, I think there were three, there were three or four lacunas in the text, so missing pieces. Um, obviously in the manuscript tradition, those pieces are lost. Um, they don't affect the readability of the book. Um, they, they, you can tell from where they start and where they end that they're just whatever. They, you're not missing chunks of the argument. So I highly recommend this book. I don't think you need to have a really good background in, in anything, um, in philosophy, uh, in ancient history. You don't really have to need, need to know anything about Cicero. You don't need to know about the Epicureans and the Stoics. I mean, it help. You probably get more out of the book, but you don't need to. It's it's a very interesting read in and of itself, and I think you know, I think it might really for those who don't really know a lot about philosophy or theology or whatever, um, it might it could probably really serve as a as a, a springboard into um, other um, books on this subject. So for that reason, I highly recommend it. Just in closing, just say, as I said, or as I suggested, the book doesn't offer many conclusions, um, but there's a lot of really interesting, uh, um, there's a lot of really interesting and suggestive passages. And, and the thing I liked most was the discussion of providence. So basically um, the observations like that, that was the best part for me was was in the third book where I think the Epicurean is observing that the gods don't help good men uh, any more or any less than they help evil men. And and I found that that part of the book extremely interesting and, and thought inspiring. So but at the end of the book, Cicero, who doesn't play a part in this at all, he, he, he offers some points in the introduction. And then I believe the conclusions are in his person. If not, they're in someone else's, some other name that's playing Cicero's role. And he basically says, you know, I like some of these points from the Epicurean side, and I like some of these points from the Stoic side. I think I'm more side with the Stoic side, the more traditional understanding of the gods, um, rather than the Epicureans who were kind of like, not atheist but more of that side of things okay so anyway awesome book highly recommend it um for readers of all ages so anyway happy easter guys and all that jazz and we'll talk to you soon thanks very much